What's up, New Life? How y'all doing? Oh, come on, everybody. Ah, come on. What's up, New Life? How's everybody doing this morning? All right. There we go. There we go. All right. And always remember, Tom Pounder never lets the truth get in the way of a good story. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Although it'd be fun to make a TikTok channel for rollerblading. That sounds good. Um, hey, I wanted to, before we get into the meat of it, because of the fact that uh, we didn't have the announcement up here, but Brennan can't stop me from announcing something right now because I'm here. Um, we are doing a men's breakfast next Sunday here at 9 a.m. Uh, my buddy Mark Z, if, I've never had uh, brown sugar bacon before, before he started making it. And yeah, there we go. Somebody knows the joys of brown sugar bacon. Come on. I'll tell you what, that is one of nature's nectars right there, brown sugar bacon. So if you have never had that, come next, sat next Saturday, 9 a.m. It's going to be awesome. And uh, oh, so freaking good. All right. So this morning, we get to talk about one of my favorite topics, a topic that I, um, that, that really, it touches everybody's life all across the board. Um, it's something that really can dictate um, the level of freedom or the level of anxiety that you have in your life. Um, absolutely. And it's a topic that Jesus talks about more than he talks about heaven and hell combined. It's a topic that Jesus, uh, he talks about this more than anything else in all of all of the New Testament, other than the kingdom of God, 11 out of 39 parables talk about this. One in every seven verses in the gospel of Luke is about this. And then finally, half of all mar over half of all marriages in America right now are ending in divorce. And the number one t reason why they're, they're pointing as the number one stressor that pointed them to divorce is about this topic. So this morning we're gonna be talking about finances. A biblical view of finances. What does God say about it? How crazy is that? Jesus talks about it more than he talks about heaven and hell combined, right? So before we jump in, one of the things I want to throw out there is this. Jesus, literally, you look at him in the Bible and, you, and he's de depicted in two different ways. One, um, you see in, in Revelation, in heaven, adorned as a king, gold, silver, I mean, like precious jewels everywhere, wealth, adornment, everything. You see this, and, and whether you live wealthy, whether you're wealthy now, we're to live like Jesus. We also see Jesus when he came to earth. He was a carpenter. The Bible said he had no place to lay his head. He had nothing, right? No, phys no money at all, right? So he both lived wealthy and lived poor, but the, the, the argument here that I'm going to make this morning is whether you have a lot or a little to live like Jesus. No, no health and wealth argument here. What it is is Regardless of where we are, we're to live like Jesus and we're to look at what does the Bible say about our money and about our finances and how do we have a biblical understanding and live in a biblical way for that. So is that fair? Are we good? All right, good. So for me personally, I'll share just a little bit about my story. I was in ministry for a long time, loved it, amazing. Um, you know, I still am in ministry now, but in the, biz in the business world, um, when, I mean, I've literally been on, on all spectrums of this, right? I mean, so much so that uh, <laughs> literally, a, you know, there was a time where I was trying to go to NIH because they'd pay you $300 to give your blood. So I was trying to get $300 to get blood to buy Christmas presents for my family, right? So I've been in that section and, you know, over the last number of years since, you know, look, I, the opposite of that. It's just been very, very good financially. But what I can tell you is regardless of where you are, right, everybody always has reasons why they can't do what the Bible says to do with finances, right? Because, well, when this happens, when this happens, tomorrow I'll do it. If I made more money, you know, if I made more money, then, I'd, then I could uh, get out of debt. If I made more money, then I could invest. If I made more money, then I could be generous with, with people. I'm going to respectfully just call bogus, right? The Bible says that if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. And if you're not faithful in little, you're not going to be faithful in much. So, so when, when things happen, you make an extra hundred grand next year, the government takes half of it, and then of the other half, 
I, I'm telling you, because I've got lots of friends that go, that go through this, that, that all say they'll be different. And then they buy bigger toys, they have nicer vacations, and they go out to eat, and then the money just disappears, right? And then they don't have money to, to uh, get out of debt, they don't have money to give, they don't have money to invest, right? So regardless, if you're faithful and little, it'll translate to faithful and much. And if you're not faithful and little, I don't care what happens in your life, unless you change, you won't be faithful and much, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the premise I'm working on here is that the only way to see real change happen, it starts here. Okay, cool. All right, so let's jump in. We're gonna talk about three topics. We could talk about all of these topics for days and days and days, but we're gonna talk about three topics and kind of go through um, a baseline of what the Bible says about this. The first one is... Um, something that robs a lot of us of, of joy, right? I mean, the average American has $16,210 in debt. Do you understand the average American has a net worth of negative money, right? So here's the deal. The Bible, Jesus came to set us what? Starts with F. Free, exactly. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, seven, that the borrower is slave to the lender, right? The borrower is slave to the lender. So if we are in debt, we are slaves, right? You gotta understand all of the connotations that come with slavery. The Lord Jesus came to give us freedom, not to bring us into slavery, but when we take ourselves into debt, we put ourselves into bond the bondage of slavery. Who gets excited about that? Who says, yeah, I wanna be in, in slavery. I wanna be in bondage. Nobody. He came to give us, our, and I want us to say it because I want us to feel it and, and believe it. So give me your best William Wallace. Jesus came to give us what? Freedom. That's right, exactly. So if the borrower is slave to the lender, if you're in debt, you're slave to the lender, then we need to get out of debt, right? The Bible is saying, get out of that. He, everything in the Bible is, is taking us from slavery to freedom, right? And that's where we need to be. So with that said, um, not all debt is, is necessarily bad debt. We'll throw that out. There's, there's, there's four debts that I see like all over the place. Um, mortgage debt, student loans, car payments, credit cards, and medical debt. Those are the ones that I see with, with lots of, I, I, because of what I do in real estate and also when I was, you know, I worked with a lot of young adults for years and years and years and, and would help them with their finances all the time. Um, those, are the, those are the debts that would come across all the time. Well, not all of those debts are, are bad debts, right? A mortgage debt is an investment. Student loans, it's a little bit more tricky, right? You, you spend 200 grand for a college education to get out of school making, you know, whatever entry level, uh, where you're just paying that off for, for a lifetime. I don't know that that's necessarily the best way to go, but what I will say is still student, student loans are an investment in yourself and you are an appreciating asset, right? So that is something you're just gonna have to wrestle with, but to put yourself in bondage for, year, for your whole adult life to just try to climb out of that is, is a rough place to be, right? Um, car payments, I'll tell you, you don't need the nice, I mean, literally, you can choose. One of, the, one of the principles that we gotta understand is don't let the immediate get in the way of the ultimate, right? Don't let the immediate get in the way of the ultimate, right? So if, if we have dreams and goals that we have in our life, a, a massive car payment is gonna keep you poor. It's gonna keep you in debt. It's gonna rob you. Drive, drive a, a less nice car, drive an older car until you are at a place where you can make that payment without putting yourself in massive debt. Credit cards, oh my gosh. Here's something we gotta understand with credit cards. Anybody remember uh, when like McDonald's and all the, all the fast food places only took cash? Anybody else remember that? All right, so what do you guys do? Well, I, I still remember the first time I walked into that Greenbrier McDonald's like years ago and there was a credit card swiper and I was like, whoa, they're taking credit cards now? It's crazy. Well, I learned that McDonald's went from an average order of just over $4 to when they ins instituted the credit card swiper, their average order went to over $8. Why? You don't feel it, yeah, the, the immediate. I, 
I get what I want. I do what I want. Boom, swipe, swipe, swipe. I'll deal with it later. I'll deal with it later. Sounds like our government, right? Like it's, it's just like, I'll just deal with it later. I'll deal with it later. And then it does not work, right? Because someday you have to deal with it, right? That's the whole thing. But then we look at it like, I want a nice TV, swipe it. I want to go out to dinner, swipe it. I want Starbucks, swipe it. I want, you know, a, a $6 soda, swipe it. You know, I close alcohol. I mean, literally, I was looking at, a, you know, some budgets. Like, I mean, literally, the amount of money people spend on all of these things when they're trying to accomplish goals, it just is so far out of whack when we are, are so focused on the immediate instead of focusing on the ultimate, right? That's, that's just so important for us to live within our means, right? It's, it's funny, I, I gave a message on finances over at Linton Hall a few months ago and I talked to, I, I mentioned guns and ammo. Somebody came up to me afterwards and he's like, Chris, you're never gonna believe my wife and I were just having the biggest argument because I kept spending money on guns and ammo and, and she's like, you need to stop spending that money on guns and ammo and she's like, and you talked about that this morning, so convicting. All right, I'm gonna stop spending money on guns. So whatever your, whatever your thing is, Stop spending money on it if you can't afford it. Just don't, just don't, right? So with that said, um, we look at Proverbs 25, 28, and it says that the person who lacks self-control is like a city with no walls. Think of ancient Near East culture, right? Or, or one of our favorite uh, like stories throughout all of history, the story of Troy, right? The Trojan horse, right? Well, what happened with the Trojan horse, right? They get in, they get behind the walls. What happens when they're behind the walls? What happens when there's no walls? You're what? You're vulnerable, right? Well, if we just swipe it, swipe it, swipe it, swipe it, and don't think about it, we'll deal with it later, don't have any self-control, what happens? We make ourselves vulnerable. We, may, we put ourselves in bad situations. I mean, think about security clearances. I mean, I, I don't want a show of hands because then we'll probably get in trouble, right? But, uh, but like all the people with security clearances, that's one of the things that, like, like you can't get security clearances if you're in insane debt, right? Because you're vulnerable, right? We gotta understand that. That when we lack self-control, we put ourselves in a place where we're vulnerable and it keeps us from freedom. And that's why Christ died for us, to give us freedom right? If we don't understand that how we deal with our finances is an immensely spiritual thing, then we're missing it. We're missing it, okay? So how do we get out of debt if you're in debt? Some of you guys are are in a great place right now. No debt. You've been awesome. You're amazing. Um, That's great. But I would imagine that there's a lot of people in here that are like, ah, you don't understand, Chris. You don't understand my life. Well, I do. I've been there, right? Like, tried to sell my blood, okay? Like I've been there, right? Okay, so, so here's, the, uh, here's the thing. If you're, there's something called Parkinson's Law. And what Parkinson's Law is, is um, and I asked first service and like nobody was with me on this. So like, but I do have a second thing too. Anybody been there with like a, a toothpaste? You get a new, new tube of toothpaste and you uh, like literally just so lavish, like all over the toothbrush. And then you, anybody there? No? All right. So we got one. All right. But then when, you, when you're at the end of it, like you're like squeezing it, like putting an elbow into it, a knee onto it, like on the counter, just trying to get a little bit out, right? So that you can get it on, right? So when you have a lot, you, you're willing to use a lot. When you have a little, you're willing to use a little. All right. So only one person likes that analogy. So let's go to a second analogy. How many of you guys have gone on vacation sometime in the last couple of years? How many of you guys know what it's like the last couple days before you go on vacation that you're massively productive? You do more work in those two days than you've done in the last month. Anybody been there? Yes, you get it. Because Parkinson's law, we do what, we we fill the time allotted to us. We fill whatever is allotted to us. So what we do, if we want to get out of debt, we need to look at what we have available. And so my wife and I did something which, you know, I found out that a lot of financial people recommend this later, but we just naturally did it. It was called forced poverty. So when we looked at our bank account and it looked like our bank account was growing, um, we were a lot more free to just spend, 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 right? Even though we had other goals that we were, were there and so our money disappeared. But when we looked at our bank account and it looked like it was a little tighter, then we were a lot more frugal with what we spent, right? Anybody ever been there? Maybe? All right, so a couple, I see some heads. All right, good. Some heads nodding and some heads. Um, all right, so, uh, so that's, that's the truth with our money. So, so what we did was we started putting 
uh, money in account that we weren't looking at, right? So we kept the money that we needed in the one account so that we weren't just saying, ah, just swipe, whatever, we just spend it, spend it, spend it. Um, it is this forced poverty? So we're, we're able to do that. And we're able to, and we'll talk about this later, to put money aside for the things that we care about so that we're not just spending money with no plan on it, right? So that's where it's just really, really important for us to look at at that so that we can get out of debt, make a really good decision, put money aside so that we can, you know, make good decisions on the things that we're going to talk about next. So if you're in debt right now, if you have consumer debt, what I'll say is there's some keys to getting out of debt. And here it is. And, and I'm telling you, if, if you have debt, please write it down on your phone, like, like do whatever you need to do to understand these things. So one, create a budget and live within it, Right? If you don't have a budget, you're just gonna spend what you feel like spending, and if you spend what you feel like spending, guess what? You're gonna feel like spending. <laughs> That's just the way it works, right? Uh, number two, force poverty, right? Put the money in the account that you need and put everything else in a side account so that you can make decisions not based on emotion, but based on a decision you made ahead of time. Number three, okay, so I think Dave Ramsey is awesome if you are in debt or working to get, get out of debt. I, I'm not a big fan as far as like how to become wealthy um, of, of Dave's, uh, of his model, but for most Americans that are in debt and need to get out of debt, I think he, he's the best there is, right? And so um, what he talks about is a debt snowball where he says, find your smallest debt, even if it's a lower interest payment, just get rid of that smallest debt and pay that first because that's the way that we work, right? Winning begets winning. Momentum. You know, John Maxwell talks about the big mo. You see it in sports teams, right? You get this momentum, right? So you pay your small debts off first, and then you move to your bigger ones so that you're moving with momentum. You're living in a victorious cycle rather than a cycle that's destructive, right? Um, take, if, if you're in debt, again, this is for people that are in debt, is, is my belief on Dave Ramsey, is that uh, take a Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. He will help you get out of debt. Um, and then the last thing is this, um, you know, I just had a call with, uh, with a friend of mine who called me the other day um, uh, because he's got massive credit card debt and medical debt and, and other stuff there. I just want to let you know, if, you're, if you have collections, if you have credit card debt, if you have medical debt, they will settle for like 25 cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar. So um, if, if you create a plan, now if you settle and then just get back right back into it, you're gonna be in trouble. So um, they will settle on that stuff. So that's, it's just really important. Now, it's all about who we become. There's a book called Atomic Habits by a guy named James Clear. It's one of my favorite books um, that I've read in the last couple of years. And his whole idea behind it is that every day we're having an election to become who we wanna become, right? And you can take this from, from the financial piece to the spiritual piece, to being a dad, a husband, a mom, a, a sister, whatever it is, you can take it across the board, is that every day we're having an election on who we're becoming, right? And every action we take is a vote that we're either becoming more like the person we want to be or that action makes us less like the person we want to be. But here's the cool thing, is that every vote, to win the election, you only have to win by majority. You don't have to win unanimously, right? You make a bad decision and swipe the card one, one too many times, it's okay as long as the next vote and the next vote and the next vote will bring you more into line with who you want to become, right? It's a really powerful book, thinking it through our actions dictate who we become. So with that said, um, you know, look at that, get out of debt. But if you get out of debt and don't change here who we are and the fact that we, we end up tearing down the walls and don't have self-control, you're just going to get right back into debt. So it, you need to become a new person, right? Romans 12, you know, be transformed. All right. So next, investing, right? So there's a parable that Almost everybody's heard, if you've ever been, if you've been around church for long at all, the parable of talents. Who's heard of the parable of talents? Raise your hand if you've heard about the parable of talents. Okay, only a couple of you guys, or, or have I just lost like some people <laughs> here? Come on, come on. Um, all right, so parable of the talents, right? I remember the first time I heard this, I was in high school. Um, I'd just become a Christian, and uh, I was like, what is talents? Like juggling, like all the other stuff. Ancient Near East culture, like talents, are, it's, it's a unit of money. So let's think million dollars, right? So, um, so a talent is, let's just call it a million dollars. So here we go. Matthew 25, starting in verse 14, it says, 
For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, to another um, one, each according to their ability, and then he went away. He who received the five talents went at once and traded them, and he made five more. And the one he gave two talents, he made two more. And the one who gave one talent, he dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, <coughs> the master of those servants came back and he set all accounts with them. The one who received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here's five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'll set you up over much. Enter the joy of your master. To the one that brought two, he came forward saying, Master, you delivered me two. Here's two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, you've been faithful over little. I will set you over, over much. Please get this. If something's said in scripture more than once, it is so powerful for us to remember, right? He says here, and this is a kingdom principle. If you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. If you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. Don't think that your, your, your circumstance dictates how you act, because it's not. You dictate how you act. If you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much, okay? Just gotta get there. And I hope I'm not like being too like accusatory because it's like really, really important for all of us. Like this is to me too, all of us have to get it. But it's, um, the last one he said, um, the one he re received one, he came forward saying, master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I hid your talent in the ground. Here is what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew I reap where I didn't sow and gather where I scattered no seed. You ought to have invested my money with the bankers so that at my coming, it would receive my own, I would have received my own with interest. So take this talent from him and give it to the one with 10, right? If you're faithful little, you'll be faithful much and you'll be given much, right? So we gotta understand that. Um, for everyone who has, more will be given and he'll have an abundance. And from the one who has not, even what they have, even when you're not faithful, what you have will be taken away from you. Cast this worthless serpent out into the darkness into a place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, this was so crazy to me because I'd heard about finances and it just, I'd heard this so many times, but this was the thing that stuck out to me that was just, just nuts to me. And I never saw it before, before. Like, like, but then you see it and you don't unsee it. Jesus says to the person that does not invest their money, right? You don't think of that person as, as wicked, right? You just think, no, they're uninformed. They're not, whatever. But that's not what he says. The person that doesn't invest, he calls wicked and lazy. Whew. If you spend everything you get and you don't invest, you don't put your money aside, Jesus calls them wicked and and lazy. Wow. Do you guys get the weight of that? I, I, I mean, that's not what I think of. I, I mean, you don't think of somebody as wicked. You think of like a murderer as wick, wicked, right? Hitler's wicked. But the person that doesn't invest their money also is in that wicked category. Wow. So what does that mean? Well, we've been given three things, and I, and I think anything of value falls under this umbrella of the three things. Our time, right? All of us 24 hours in the day. Our talent, right? Maybe it is juggling. <laughs> our talent and our treasure, the finances we have, right? Like these are the three things that we have, and these are what have been entrusted to us, right? If you're a Christian, you believe that, that the Lord has entrusted us, but it's all his, right? That's what we believe. And so if we've been given this, then what do we do with it? Proverbs 21.5 says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Diligence is defined as showing care and one's work and duties, right? So if we understand that laziness and wickedness go hand in hand, when we talk about investing, everybody's always looking for the get rich quick scheme, right? I mean, how many, how many of us know somebody that's, that's told you about this thing they're going to do where they're going to be massively wealthy overnight? Anybody? Yeah. A couple of hands. All right. So, so we, see, we see that. I, I, I hear about it all the time. You know, the world I live in, I hear about it all the time. Well, the reality is when we look at the investments we need to make, it's with 
diligence, right? Where we're working hard for it, right? Sometimes you hear about somebody getting wealthy quick, but I promise you it was a 10 year overnight success story where they were working for 10 years on becoming the right person and then boom, the right thing, the right circumstances came along, right? Harder I work, the luckier I get, Yogi Berra. So, um, so that's where it's really important for us to understand that this is what the Bible says, is that we're required to be a good steward. And, and, and listen, it also says put, the bank, put it in the bank with, with interest. Over the last year, I think something like, like 30% of all the dollars in circulation have been printed in the last year, um, which has caused crazy inflation, like three to 5% of inflation. So if you put it in the bank making less than 1% and inflation is eating up like three to 5% of everything you got, you're actually losing money by just putting your money in the bank right? So we've got to understand, we've got to be wise as serpents, as gentle as doves. That's what the Bible says. So it's not okay to just be uninformed, right? We need, we need to understand that the Bible is very clear that we need to be good when it comes to our finances. So what, do we, so what are some keys to investing? Some things, understand. Um, I'm in real estate. I love real estate. Um, you look at this just nationwide, you see that, that people that own a house versus rent a house, um, that their net worth is 48 times the number of somebody that rents a house. Not 48% more, 48x, 48 times, right? Like 48 times as much. So it's, it's really important understanding that. Number two is if your employment if employer matches your, uh, your retirement, I mean, fund that baby. Like, make sure you're getting, like, all of that money out there, right? Like, get, like, put everything in there. Again, Parkinson's law, right? You'll figure out a way to live on the rest, but, but, like, that's free money. Fund that, right? Make sure that's there. Um, and then number three is we've got to put money aside. Again, Parkinson's law, right? Every month, regardless whether you have little or have much, you know, put money aside for investing. That's got to be something that we do monthly money aside for investing. So here are the keys to, to investing. This is what the Bible is very clear on, and I just want to make sure that we understand this. One, we must understand that Jesus expects us to grow whatever he entrusts to us, right? If he entrusts something to us, he expects it to grow, right? Very clear from, from, the, from the Bible there, Matthew 25. Number two, there's wisdom in many counselors, right? We need to bring friends into our life that are gonna advise us into right financial moves. I've got like a personal board of directors in my own life, people that I go to when I'm gonna make big financial decisions, when I'm gonna make big any decisions, right? Um, but, but here's something to understand. Um, there are people that I trust that are awesome dads, that are awesome husbands, that are awesome, you know, just relationally, but they're not great business people. So those aren't people that I go and ask about finances, right? right? So, so you find the people that are good in their world. You know, I call it their genius zone. You find people that are good in their genius zone and you ask them for their advice. There's wisdom in that. Bible says that uh, Proverbs 8 is all about wisdom, right? That, that's wisdom. So go find those people and, and spend time with them. You'll learn to think like they think, right? You'll learn to understand things in a way that they, they understand things that you didn't right? So it's really important. Dave Ramsey uh, says this. He said, when he hung out with hundred heirs, he was a hundred heir. When he hung out with thousand heirs, he became a thousand heir. When he hung out with millionaires, he became a millionaire. And now he's hanging out with billionaires, right? So that, that whole idea of who we hang out with will dictate how we think. And it's true, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I think 31 talks about like, don't be deceived, right? That we can be deceived, that we can hang out with the wrong people. Uh, bad company corrupts good morals, right? That, that, we, we can deceive ourselves thinking who we hang out with doesn't impact who we are, right? But when we hang out with the right people, it's gonna make us think bigger and think better. When we hang out with people that are gonna make us think smaller and make bad decisions, it's gonna impact how we live. So understand that. Um, so uh, number three, only invest in things you understand. You know, Warren Buffett says this, um, you know, he says, one, don't lose money. Number two, only invest in things that you understand, right? Uh, and, and the Bible also says, shocking that, that his wisdom is, uh, is true with what the Bible says, right? Shocking. Um, Proverbs 24, three says, by wisdom a house is built and through understanding it is established, right? So those that are wise will build a good house and, and, and understanding, right? Getting knowledge and using that knowledge will, will establish your house. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures, right? So you, if you invest in things that you don't understand, 
your money's gonna go away really quick. Um, one of the, any, anybody that deals in the world of finances, there's a book called Richest Men in Babylon, which is like one of the you know, pivotal books that, uh, that people read on finances in America, like just, just huge. But he talks about the key there is, is who are you listening to for your financial advice? You know, I get people all the time, just because the world I live in come to me with like stock tips. And uh, like the reality is a lot of them are in a world like, like that has nothing to do with stock right? And they come and bring me stock tips. And I'm like, hey, you know what? If I want to learn about your world, like, like I'm going to listen. I'm like anything on the IT world, I'm going to listen. But this is like, like this is not the area of core competency. I'm not going to just jump into that because that's again, trying to get rich quick, trying to cut corners. And when you cut corners, you know, the whole thing falls down. So, right. We, we want to be in places where we understand. Um, so don't try to get rich. Number four, don't try to get rich quick getting rich quick is lazy and that's how we lose money. And then the last thing here is um, we've got to understand we need an ROI and an ROTI, return on investment and a, and a return on our time invested on the three things that we've been entrusted. Our time, where you spend your time, the Lord expects a return, right? Our time, our talent, every single, like every single person in here, you have a gift you are talented in some area. Are you using that? Are you serving others? Are you serving the world? Are you serving the kingdom with that? That Are you getting an ROI on your gifting and your treasure, your finances, right? We have to be getting an ROI on our time, our talent, and our treasure. So now we're going to get into the, and, and I'm, I'm telling you all these things there's so much more that the Bible says on all of these things. We probably talk about for hours and hours, uh, but I wanted to touch the key points on the three most important topics that I see. So the last one is giving. Well, when I was a, a professional Christian, uh, when I was on staff with the church, um, uh, I always had a hard time talking about giving. And this is why, because I got paid from the church at the time, right? Well, now I don't get paid from the church. So I, I, like, I've got no qualms about just saying, this is what the Bible says, and this is what it's clear about, and there's no like, weird like, conflict of interest at all. This is like straight up, I don't make anything from this. This is what the Bible says, and it's very clear. And I also want to be clear, everything that I've said here, we're all going to fight for our limiting beliefs. So limiting beliefs are, oh, well, I'll, I'll be generous. I'll be hospitable. I'll give when I have more money. You know, and you can fight for those beliefs, but you know what happens when we fight for our limiting beliefs? You get to keep them. They're yours. You get to keep them. So if you want to think bigger, then you got to listen and, and say, okay, I'm not going to fight for the beliefs. I'm not going to fight to stay where I am. I'm going to look to say, what does the Bible say? And even if it doesn't feel right, if the Bible says it, the Bible is true. And that's part of our transformation process that we talk about in Romans 12. So um, the Bible says this, and we all know the answer to this. Do not put the Lord your God to this. Starts with a T. Test. Yes, absolutely. So I know that you guys have heard this before, but there's this verse right here. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Wait, don't put the Lord your God to the test. This is the only place in the whole Bible. He says, test me in this, test me in this. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is so crazy. Why does he say, test me in this? This is the whole, this whole section here is about how the Lord is gonna teach us that what we think is not necessarily, it doesn't make sense, right? We think that the more we hold on to, the bigger it would grow, right? But he says, be generous, and somehow he's going to throw open the floodgates. You're, like, he's going to open it up like crazy, right? So I, you know, I, I used to play a lot of golf. I don't play as much anymore because I've gotten really, if you don't spend a lot of time, you get really bad really quick. But in golf, here's one of the crazy things. You think that if you were to hit up, the ball would go up. But in golf, you have to hit down in order for the ball to go up. And if you hit up, the ball stays down, right? So it's this opposite, like inverse reaction to a golf ball. The same thing is true with our finances in the kingdom, right? Here with our giving. You know, when we, when we, when we give generously, the Lord, he says, test me. Because 
Every, it's, it's totally contrary to what we would expect that if we're generous, if we give, if we give to the church, to missionaries, to people out there in need, that somehow he's gonna throw open the floodgates. So, um, you know, one of my favorite stories, I got a call a few weeks ago from a friend of mine that he's been in ministry. He came into ministry and I'll tell you, he made nothing. His, like everybody around him was like, oh, you need to make more money. You need to make more money. But he felt called to come into ministry and make nothing. His whole adult life, he's been in the lowest tax bracket, the lowest tax bracket. And he called me and, and what I said to him early on was, I was like, hey, the Lord is going to bless you. He takes care of his people. He's going to take care of you. I, I've seen it myself. I could tell you like another day, another message. I'll tell you about times where like miraculously, like, you know, I mean, I'll just say this. Like there was a time I didn't have $1,500 when I was in ministry to pay for my kids' sports. And literally somebody shows up at my door and just said, hey, Chris, the Lord spoke to me and I'm supposed to give you, I'm supposed to give you something, handed me a check. I opened it up, it's $1,500. The Lord takes care of his people. I'm just telling you. Like it's, and I've got story after story after story. That's crazy on that. But it's not my notes, so I won't go into it. Uh, but, <laughs> but the crazy thing is he called me a few weeks ago and he's like, Chris, I've been in the lowest tax bracket my whole life. I've been serving the Lord. And I remember you said, the Lord will take care of his people. Just give generously and he's gonna take care of me. He's like, I, because of like some real estate that I bought, uh, you know, which you can buy even if you're in a low tax bracket. He's like, I've got a net worth of over half a million dollars. And I've, I, I, I make less money than anybody I know. He's like, and it's just insane. The Lord has taken care of me. And I'm telling you guys, give generously and you're going to reap generously. Like, it is, it's, it's a law of the universe, right? This isn't health and wealth. This is right here in there. That, that the, the more generous we are, the more generous. You just cannot outgive God. Okay, that's the principle. You can't outgive God. So, I was reading a book a while back. Um, it's called Living by the Book by Howard Hendricks. And one of the things he said was, um, take a chapter in the Bible, if you really want to understand it, and read it, that whole, or not the chapter, the whole book. A book of the Bible and read it, like chapter one to the last chapter every day for 30 days. And so I was like, well, I don't want to read like a 30 chapter book because there's no way I'm going to actually do it. So I just picked like a small obscure book in the Old Testament. I found the book of Haggai in the Old Testament, right? It's two chapters. And I, and I recommend you, if, if you want to see, see how you see your finances change, like, like just do that for the next month, next 30 days, read those two chapters and see what happens in your finances. Well, here we go. This is what it says. Now the Lord, uh, chapter one, verse five. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Now he says this twice. Give careful thought to your ways. Which, what does that tell us to do? Think about it. Give careful thought to our ways, right? Like give careful thought to your ways. All right, so give careful thought to the ways. You have planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages, but only to put them in a purse with holes in them. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down the timber of my house so that I may take pleasure and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord, because my house which remains in a ruin while you're busy with your own house. You're not being generous. And so listen, I, I punish my kids sometimes, but the real goal is to discipline them. What's the point of discipline? to teach them, to train them, right? But how many of you guys that are parents have ever put your kids in time out or whatever or sent them to the room to go think about what they've done? Anybody? All right, so this is what happens here. So I had a friend of mine, a mentor to me, that said this. He, he looked at people's finan like finances and he said this to me early in my life. He's like, Chris, I don't understand it, but when I look at Christian people, definitely people that are Christians and they don't give anything to the Lord, I see over and over and over again that they have higher maintenance bills, higher repair bills. Like, like the money just gets, gets blown away. And he's like, whatever you do, just make sure you're generous to the Lord. And you think about that as like punitive, but it's not. The Lord says, give careful thought to your ways. Go sit in time out and think about it, right? Like, like, like be changed. Or we can be like our kids that like go sit in time out and then they come back more like, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, right? Like he's saying, go think about it, right? Give careful thought to your ways. And I know that some of you guys have been there and I've seen it for my own life where you bring home money, but at the end of the month, you're like, where did it all go? It's gone. What happened? And because you put it in pockets with holes in it, right? And he says that if you are only thinking about yourself and you're not being generous, 
He says, think about this. This is the law of the universe. When you, when you put it out there, see if I don't throw open the storehouses, right? The Lord disciplines his children to bring us to repentance, to bring us to understand this. These are laws of the universe and, and we cannot disconnect how finances run with our spiritual life. They're so intertwined. And I'll tell you, the last thing I'm gonna say is this, on this front. I promise you, your view of how tightly you're holding your finances or how open-handed you are to the Lord is a direct barometer of your spiritual health. 100%. You cannot separate those two. How tightly you're holding your finances or how tightly you're trusting the Lord with your life. You can't divorce those two. They come hand in hand, 100%. So, we gotta give careful thought to our ways. I'm gonna give us a chance to do that here. So, how do we give? One, set aside, I say a minimum of 10%. You know, the Bible uses the 10% number, but I think honestly we should give more than 10%. And you know what? Test the Lord. Test them. Test them. This is the only place where we can test them. Test them and see if he doesn't throw open the floodgates, right? So give, give 10% to the Lord, whether that's your church, missionaries, you know, uh, heck, the Bible is very clear that we're to take care of widows and orphans, right? Like we see people that are in need. You know, we help those around us. We're, we open, handed, generous. Um, and then here's the other thing. Start giving more than 10%. I, I'm telling you, it changes your life when you just start opening your hands and stop thinking that every time you give stuff away, we're in a a zero-sum scarcity mentality that if I give it away, it won't come back. Because the Lord, I mean, if you're a believer here and you believe that if God makes a promise, it, he, he upholds his promise, let's see some hands. Anybody believe that? All right. So his promise is, test me in this, see if I don't throw up the floodgates. I don't care. You, you can't say, Chris, but I don't have any money. Chris, I'm in debt. Chris, 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 I got all these reasons. You fight for them, you get to keep them. That's fine. But this is the transformation that we're looking for, right? To become more like Jesus. It'll change your life.